Jonathan Gardner. I'm the uh, 2018 chair of the Sustainable Change Alliance. We're a Santa Barbara-based, impact-oriented angel investment group. We've been around for about two or so years. We've hosted a dozen or two events. We've invested north of $3 million in a variety of companies. All of those companies are impact-oriented companies where they're seeking a positive social or environmental outcome as well as a successful financial return. Um, and we'll go through some of the terms about impact investing in a bit. You can learn more about Sustainable Change Alliance at www.sustainablechangealliance.com or .org, and that's the uh, plug for the evening. Um, we've got a great panel tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce each of them. I'm then going to do a two or three slides just to have a common set of terminology around sustainable investing, because you've heard a lot of terms, but I want to just put a little meat on the bones. Each of the presenters will have about a half an hour. They'll have, they all have a couple of slides to share with you, and I'm sure they'll, there'll be a lot of questions and answers. If you have specific questions for the specific speaker, please ask it at that time. And then at the end of each of the three panelists, we'll have time for group discussion. So if you have uh, questions for the full group, uh, say them to that point. Um, I've been told this is not a shy audience, so I'm sure we'll have a pretty good interactive uh, 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 conversation. So here are our panelists in order of uh, speaking. Our first speaker is going to be Alex Kramer on the end here. Alex is a corporate development and investment principal at Patagonia and Tin Shed Ventures. Tin Shed Ventures invests in responsible startups with innovations that help Patagonia build the best product while causing the least amount of environmental harm. Um, Alex is a former neighbor of mine, and until I met the other two presenters, I thought he had the coolest job in town. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Carla Mora in the middle here. Carla is the founder and managing partner of Alante Capital, an impact investment fund working to catalyze a more sustainable future for the apparel industry. Alante invests in innovation that empowers circularity to improve production practices, supporting mindful consumption, and recover and recycle apparel waste. And you'll learn more about what she's doing um, in this very, very large industry in a minute. And our final speaker will be Jenny Dew. Um, Jenny was the second employee of Appeal Sciences. Uh, for those of you who know and are investors in Appeal Sciences, congratulations. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's probably the hottest company coming out of Santa Barbara recently um, and is literally trying to save um, f the fruit and vegetable um, industry in the, around the world. So it's very, very powerful. Uh, Jenny runs almost everything. She's the uh, chief of operations. So it's regulatory affairs, compliance, quality control, supply chain, logistics, IT facilities, and environmental health and safety. So, um, so we're in the presence of three very impressive professionals who are operating in very impactful ways. So let me just steal just a couple of minutes to talk about sustainable, in, uh, sustainable investing in the universe. Um, so about 20%, and that number is growing um, pretty rapidly, of all professionally managed money in America has some form of impact consideration. And you might have heard of the three um, uh, acronyms I'm going to use now. The first is environmental, social, and governance. You, you know it as ESG. That's looking at risk factors beyond purely technical valuations. It's kind of an integrated approach. This could be things like, do they treat their employees well? Do they have a production chain that doesn't pollute the world? Uh, do they allow their employees to, uh, to, to have, a, have a healthy life? Do they have a separate chairman and, uh, and CEO? The next level is something called socially responsible investment, SRI. And this is basically positive and negative screens. So a positive screen could be, I want a company that has a workforce that represents the community in which it's based. A negative screen could be, I don't want guns or gambling or carbon, hydrocarbons, whatever it, whatever it is. And then the final area, and this is actually the term that is impact investing, and this is slightly nichier. Impact investing is the company is organized and is explicitly trying to create a positive social or environmental income as well as a successful financial venture. Not all companies do that. Not all companies that you guys are involved in do that. But that's really the definition of impact investing. And why would, why would you do any of these things? Well, they could be just because you want to feel good about yourself and good about your investments. Um, it could be smart investing. I don't know that many serious investors nowadays who don't look at ESG at a very minimum. And it could finally be because you want to make a difference. You could view this as your investment philanthropy. So why does all this stuff matter? Well, it matters for a lot of reasons that are purely financial. It matters because intangible assets are an increasing part of the company's valuation. So you have to look at these intangible matters. It cuts across lots of industries. We know all about water for ag and food and beverage and metals and mining. Climate change, we know that all too well in terms of property, inequality, textiles and the like. 
Um, most studies will show, and this is, the, this is the big issue, the question that I get all the time, most studies will show that similar can, returns can be generated by incorporating ESG and SRI factors into your investment analysis as not. Um, I encourage you who either don't believe it or want to find more, more information about this to visit. There's two big platforms, online platforms for impact investors around the world. Uh, the first and the older is based in New York. It's called GIN, Global Impact Investing Network. Uh, the second organization is based in San Francisco, and you know the punchline. It's called Tonic, with two eyes. Uh, but I encourage you to go there. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of packaged products around that have ESG or SRI factors, um, and it's increasingly part of the traditional investment world, not, not, not just the impact investment world. And then finally, impact investing. So it's actually a relatively new area. It's been around for barely a decade. The phrase was coined by the Rockefeller Foundation just 11 years ago. And again, the ex it's an explicit intent to create a positive social or environmental outcome alongside financial returns. Um, and that intent or that impact must be intentional and measurable. Otherwise, it's just a byproduct of what the company is trying to do. The investor is seeking a blended return from risk, return, and impact. And these are companies that have what's typically called the triple bottom line profit people and planet. And again, you can buy, the, you can get investments across all asset classes, whatever your impact vertical that you're looking for, there's lots and lots of different ways to, uh, to do it. So, with that, I'm gonna, turn it I'm gonna turn it over to Alice Kramer before he stands and speaks, so I think we have a small video. Maybe you thought Patagonia only made clothing. But what if I told you that Patagonia was investing in startups? Startups that are developing innovative ways to address environmental problems. Investing in entrepreneurs using business as a way to support our planet's health through saving water, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and regenerating our soil. Tin Shed Ventures is Patagonia's investment arm. Patagonia began in the tin shed when its founder, Yvonne Chouinard, decided to change the mountain climbing world with sustainable gear, forging equipment that ignited the clean climbing movement. True to Patagonia's history, Tin Shed Ventures is all about rethinking and improving the way business is done. Some of the money earned from selling down and fleece jackets comes into Tin Shed and is then used to fund early stage companies. Companies practicing a new model of capitalism rooted in considering the long-term needs of people and the planet. Entrepreneurs use Tin Shed seed money to grow their business and make their products in an environmentally responsible way. These startups are doing incredible things, like manufacturing skateboards from recycled fishing nets, raising buffalo in a way that restores the Great Plains grasslands, and inventing safer materials for outdoor apparel. Tin Shed is working to inspire other funds to join us in investing in early stage companies. These investments can generate financial success alongside profound environmental and social changes. Whether it be funding, mentoring, or connecting the next generation of responsible business leaders, Tin Shed believes in making a better world through harnessing the power of business. Thank you, and thank you everybody for coming. So obviously I'm biased, but I think this is a really, really important topic. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, there's a lot of nuances to impact investing, responsible investing. You can do it into private companies or public companies that are screening or, or treating their employees a certain way. We, um, we obviously have a nuanced approach to it. Patagonia is known for apparel, not investing. Our, our founder has coined the phrase or, or has used the phrase vulture capitalists. He calls himself a reluctant businessman. So I'm really, I wish I was in the room when our CEO now pitched him the idea of, become, of starting a venture capital fund. So uh, I'll, I'll start by a little background of Patagonia in general and then I'm going to talk about how investing, impact investing, uh, fits into our strategy. Patagonia started, as, as the video showed, in a tin shed. Our founder started uh, Chenard equipment just to make climbing equipment. He loved climbing, he went to Yosemite all the time, and he made pitons. He hammered them into the rock, he climbed 
I did a lot of first ascents and realized that every time he came down, he pulled the piton out of the rock, a little, some, some rock came off with it, and he's like, I'm damaging the thing I love the most. And, you know, how can we do this in a better way? So he stopped making traditional pitons. He created a new one where that kind of a chalk that wedged between the rock and could be removed without damaging the rock face. And so that's, that's kind of how that, those are made in a tin shed, and that's the kind of entrepreneur we want to invest in, one that identifies a problem, says there must be a way to do this, in, there must be a better way, or identifying a problem and saying, can we make a business solution to this so that more people get on board? Uh, so Patagonia evolved as he made climbing equipment more responsibly. He realized that there were unique apparel attributes that he wanted in his climbing gear, so he started making that on his own. Um, and similarly, he realized that he was making cotton clothing, and that had a lot of chemicals in it. He started learning about what happens on the ag. He traveled to a farm. Actually, he brought all the Patagonia employees at that time to a farm to see the difference between an organic cotton growing operation and a traditional chemical intensive cotton growing organization. And since then, we've transferred to 100% organic cotton. And again, this is just his belief that Patagonia shouldn't be a business to make as much as money as possible, but to show that there's a better way. One more extension, or the next extension, um, he saw a lot of problems in the food business. He said, you know, food, the whole food chain is broken uh, from the growing it to how we transport it, how we process it, how we package it. Uh, how can we help solve that, that whole supply chain? And that's why he started Patagonia Provisions. So he started that about six years ago. Um, and they're really focused on bringing products to market that are building soil health. So all organic products, um, trying to show that there's a better way. And now we're really focused on the packaging because we have a lot of bars. Single-use packaging is, is a huge problem. And in everything we do, we realize we are contributing to emissions, making a garment, making food products, shipping it takes up a lot of energy, so how can we show a better way? Similarly, um, we realized that there must be a way to fund and, and help companies like Yvonne Chouinard a few decades ago. And that's where Tin Shed Ventures started. It started as 20 million and change. Um, initially, they thought maybe we can allocate 20 million dollars to this idea of investing in early stage companies that want to solve a problem through business. Um, that has morphed, we've invested in over, over 80 million now, and um, that's a good thing, and that's where the, the name change happened. So we think of it as, as funding the next generation of responsible businesses, and this is the tin shed that still stands today, and our founder's right in the middle, Yvonne Chouinard. This gives a, a general overview of how we think of the industries that we invest in. Um, all our money comes from the company, so like the video showed, the more jackets we sell, the better we do as a company, the more we are able to invest in these innovative startups. Um, we think of it in these ways, but you know, there, there are, sometimes we go outside of the box, and a lot of what we invest in are things that we can not only be capital providers in, but where we can help develop a product and bring a product to market. We realize that there's a lot of capital out there that wants to be you know, go into new innovative ideas. And one of the, the, the um, offerings that we have as a company is not only the voice, the association with Patagonia, but being able to say, you know, if this is a new material innovation, this is what the market needs, this is the cost point, and we have a materials innovation team in-house, uh, we have product teams in, houses, in the house that can help bring those to market. So we really see ourselves as partners with these companies, and uh, as the video showed, like one company, Boreo here, um, works off the coast of Chile, and they are gathering, they're working with local fishermen. And they are, now they're a group of, of six employees, but initially it was three employees, and one was an engineer, one had a finance background, and one had an environmental background. And he realized, there's so many, so many fish nets get thrown away, or maybe even get tossed over the side of a boat. We must be able to do something with that. And they were, you know, they could be, all be Patagonia employees. They really embrace um, finding solutions for our planet that help environmental outcomes. And that's where they said, you know, we, we can make something, we think we can make something with this. And their initial products were, uh, were skateboards, were sunglasses, and that was just uh, testing out, does this material have characteristics where you can make products out of it? Uh, we spoke with them and we realized they had this bigger vision to really become a materials innovation or a materials company that can provide 
Uh, most of it's nylon. There's some other plastic fishnets that they use. But we can provide all the, you know, a ton of nylons being used, a ton of uh, HDPE is a, the other plastic being used in the world. If all that comes from fishnets, we can solve one problem and provide a, a material to a, a broad base. Um, so that's where they're going, and, and they've created pretty cool products recently, furniture. And we, you know, I, I mentioned our development approach. We want to work with them to make nylon fiber for our jackets. And so that's where we can come in and, and work with them hand in hand and provide that support beyond just, just capital. Overall, I mean, and when we think about impact investing, it's not just um, we want to do something that's cute, that's, you know, we want to support people who are thinking and they have cool ideas, but they don't have a business behind them. Um, our mission statement at Patagonia is build the best product, cause no environmental harm, no unnecessary harm, and use business to inspire solutions to the environmental crisis. That last piece is something that we, as Tinch Adventures, really, really embrace. Um, our fund, $80 million is a great number, we're proud of it, but in the grand scheme of capital markets, that's not moving the needle. So for us, we don't just want to invest in cool ideas that you know, we would keep funding year after year. For us, success is we are investing in companies that can grow, that can pr prove to other businesses that there is a business behind thinking about the environment, thinking about social issues. And as a fund, if we can demonstrate that we have market rate returns that compared to the, the VCs up in Silicon Valley, if you're an investor and you don't even care about the planet, this might be a good strategy to pursue. And so our whole thing is we want to be that guide. And we're able to originally, you know, for these first products, the Boreo material might cost a little bit more. But with scale, that cost will come down. We want to show this innovation to our competitors. I won't name any. Um, because we think it's good for, good for business. It's good for Boreo. It's good for us as investors. And it's good for the planet. And so th that's our whole, whole approach. I think um, some companies might assume we just want to buy and, and we want to own the t innovation, but we realize that we want to write the playbook. We want to show everybody there's no magic behind this. We can just be the first movers and, and invite the world to follow. This is just another example of a collaboration that we have with one of our investment partners. So, Warnware, maybe some of you have heard of it, it's an initiative within Patagonia that wants to promote the reuse, repair, recycling of your garments. Patagonia prides itself on making really durable garments, and if you go skiing one season, we don't want you to just hang that up and buy another jacket next season. There is life left in that, whether it's with you, whether it's with your sibling, whether it's uh, somewhere else. We want to show you how you can give that product another life. So with Warnware, we actually have a, a vehicle that drives around the US. It's pretty sweet cedar uh, truck that goes around and it repairs items. It, teaches, it, it uh, teaches people how to repair. They will repair any garment, not just Patagonia, because they believe how, of this, how important this is. And we realize that people really respond to this. They want to repair their goods. They don't know how to do it. They don't really know what to do with stuff that's broken, so they just throw it away or it just sits in their closet. And we at Tinch Adventures, because we kind of Beyond investing, we're thinking about how can we create little businesses within Patagonia to, show, to, again, be that first mover. And we said, maybe we can buy back these jackets and sell them and kind of have a certified pre-owned Patagonia for all the folks that can't afford a new jacket and for folks that just maybe have kids that grow a lot and they don't want to buy a new jacket for one year. So that's where we identified Yertle, which focuses on partnering with brands to build this reuse business. Every apparel brand has warehouses full of garments that come back because they're broken, because somebody doesn't like the color and they can't resend them or resell them. And that's where they said, you know, there's a big business behind it. It's good for the planet. Um, and it's actually a service to these companies. So we teamed up and now you can, this whole business is launched and we can, you can buy a, a used Patagonia good on warmer.com. So we hope this can grow a lot. We think the reuse market has a ton of potential business-wise and Again, it's keeping things from, from ending up in landfill. And if you're going to buy a jacket and one is functionally perfect and it's used by somebody else, it's better than buying new. And it has a pretty cool story probably behind it. Yeah, so I, I like this quote by Yvonne. The best jacket you can buy is one that already exists. And we really wholeheartedly believe that. So yeah, I, this, is just, this is the last slide. Just again, 
I'll t touch a bit on some of the other things that we focus on. So a lot of what I've talked about today is things that we, could, uh, we can partner with companies on and as Patagonia and help, help bring things to market. But we'll also take kind of longer shots, uh, more far out ideas that we think have really like-minded entrepreneurs, a lot of business potential, and can have a really big impact on the planet. Uh, one example of that is Numat. They're, uh, they have the world record for hydrogen storage, and somebody might ask, why did you invest in that? Um, but we realize it's a, you know, a, a huge market, a lot of chemicals and gases are being sent around the country, and it's pretty volatile the way they're being sent. So they have, um, they have a, a structure that can, that can transport these gases at a much lower pressure. Uh, fast forward three years, we actually have identified a way to work with them and creating a structure for a textile that can have certain pro properties. And so we're finding that with a few of these companies where one quote from our, the head of our materials innovation department was, most of the innovations that can solve problems already exist, they just exist for a different market. And so I think what we can do is, is identify those, pull them into Patagonia, and then introduce it around the company and say, what can we do with this really amazing innovation, and that's where I think the collaboration piece of being a corporate venture fund versus a standalone venture fund is, is really a value add. Uh, one other thing that we're really focused on, and we see a lot of uh, financial potential and environmental return potential, is in solar. So we are Tinch Adventures, we're the venture arm, but we also have invested in a few pretty plain vanilla solar, residential solar funds, and that's just something that there are there's an investment tax credit out there that um, is good for, it allows for a tax write-off for corporations. And we have done this twice now. And that's a bigger lump sum investment that we made where we're putting solar on rooftops. And it's something that, you know, again, embracing that last pillar of our mission statement is inspire. inspire. Uh, we've had major companies come out to us and say, how do we do that? And you can use corporate dollars and we're proud to say we've influenced them in, in doing much bigger funds than we were able to do, but a lot of it is just being that first mover. So for us, impact investing is all about showing that there's a way and you don't have to sacrifice returns. And I'm proud to say that to date, our fund is very much in line with the market. Um, and so that, that's kind of how we approach it. We really believe that it can be a tool for good. Um, it doesn't have to be philanthropic only. And more and more, you know, we're, we're super pleased that there's a ton of uh, entrepreneurs that come out to us and have great ideas. And one of the hardest parts of my job, and yours probably as well, is having to say no to a lot of really good ideas, really passionate people that, you know, maybe they're too early, maybe they're just not a fit for us, but I am inspired by the next generation people coming out of college that want to use their degrees to do good. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that's, I'm happy to go in, in deeper into any of these things, but that's in general, that's, that's my. <laughs> Questions? Questions from the floor? Wow, your reputation um, maybe is not deserved. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Patagonia is doing some work with uh, the Patagonia Provisions uh, Division. Can you, uh, I don't know if that falls into your yeah. area. Yeah, so I'm happy to talk about the questions about Patagonia Provisions, our food business. And it launched actually close to when we launched, about five, six years ago. And they're another kind of startup within Patagonia. We work with them, you know, when they see, and I have a few examples here, when there, there are businesses that are embracing organic agriculture, really realizing that you don't need to deplete the soil when growing, product, growing crops, you can actually enhance the soil and enhance soil health, sequester carbon through that. And so one of the big things they're doing is trying to partner with these groups and create products out of those farm, with, or using the products that these farmers are, are growing. So in these two examples, one, Wild Idea Buffalo is a, a ranch in South Dakota. They were owned by a private equity company. They wanted to get out. They wanted to expand their land and they grass feed, grass harvest, all the buffalo. And so they're embracing all the practices that we wanna, wanna promote. So we made an investment in there and then partnered with Provisions to create a product that was like the Provisions recipe of Wild Idea Buffalo. And then we get to tell their story. So one of the benefits of Patagonia is, is the voice that we have. 
So a small company in South Dakota might not have as big of an audience as Provisions does. So we are, you know, we would create one product and they probably have 30 more products that they can sell directly. So I want to flash 100 years into the future. Have, has Patagonia or have, have your, has your investment arm put any provisions into place to ensure that the future ownership will still support the triple bottom line values that you support today? And if so, how does that work? From a Patagonia perspective or from a Tinch Adventures perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if you've ever heard anything our founder says, I'm 100% confident that these values are entrenched in now and, and in the future. So whether it stays within, it's a family-owned company, for those of you who don't know, um, I strongly believe that those will remain, and those are core to our business. So that's, that's what people see. When they see a Patagonia logo, they realize they are doing things that are good for the planet. Yes, making product is harmful, like I mentioned earlier, that's, that's a baseline, but we're trying to show a better way. For, for this kind of thing, I mean, you know, one thing that I've heard is corporate venture. You know, if anything goes wrong with the company, that's the first people that, that's the first dollars that get cut because it's not core to the business. But I, I'm, I'm proud to say more and more, this is becoming core to the business. All these relationships are really critical as we develop product, as we develop food products, and you know, solar is a strategy that we're, as we think about offsetting our overall corporate footprint, investment dollars is one of the best way to do that, to invest in solar in the US and in and abroad. Um, I think from a, how do we stick to those values? It's proven, it's proven to have a good uh, response from consumers. People really value those principles. So I think, you know, let alone again, even if you don't care about the environment, that, like that, that has brand value and people do uh, relate to that. So even if Patagonia didn't care, consumers do care. So I think we will definitely stick to those values and I think more and more, and my hope is more and more companies will realize there is benefit to making a product out of something that used to be fishnets. You know, they could buy nylon for cheaper right now, but if it has a story and we're finding that that is the case, uh, people want that, you know, that, that's, that's good for business. Um, in your conversations and when you're evaluating opportunities, is it common for people now to talk about energy return on energy invested as a metric? Energy meaning like legit, like my energy or? <laughs> energy so, energy used to make a good or yeah, something like that? Yeah, and I mean, so we track, this is kind of the categories that we look at, but for every investment, we're tracking water savings, energy savings, uh, waste diversion, chemical reduction. So we have about eight metrics that we, we focus on. And so we're always thinking about that. And even with um, these innovations, that maybe it's a bio-based material that replaces a synthetic material, if it takes a lot of water to grow that material or energy to, in the machines that are on the farm, we do that full life cycle assessment to make sure is this new innovation that looks great on the surface actually better than what's being done right now? So we're always looking at that, and that's where um, we're a pretty small investment team, but almost every investment that we look at, we bring in the materials team, the product teams, the environmental, the social team. So um, having that army of experts is really beneficial to our investment strategy. I was wondering, uh, with impact investing and having to have a measurable um, set of metrics to, to understand, you know, what, to what extent you're having an impact on the environment, have you ever run into um, a company where you can't really figure out how to accurately portray the impact? It's yeah, that, that's a good question. And I went back to, to business school and my focus was responsible investing in the broader category. And we had this argument a lot, like how do you define impact? Um, what if a company isn't, you know, it's an impact, it's doing good, but you're not sure how to measure it. And for me personally, if you can't, if you invest in a company and you can't give a, a one, two sentence overview and make it obvious like where the impact lies, those are the companies I want to focus on. So if you tell a story and say, this company works with fishermen, pay, fishermen, uh, pay them for their fishnets that they would other ordinarily throw away and then recycles them into consumer products. There's very clear like direct correlation between amount of fishnets uh, diverted from waste and products slash sales. And so for me like that pitch is, is or that quick understanding is really important and, and for me is the most impactful investments. And while we track 
these eight or 10 metrics after the fact, we, we don't go in and say, okay, if we invest today, you are going to offset or capture 100,000 tons of, or 100,000 pounds of fish nets, and then in this year, we don't really do that projection up front. It's really inherent to the business, and then we find a way to measure it afterwards. So not the best answer to your question, but. I'm curious to know if it's a closed investment venture, tin shed ventures, or is there an opportunity for others to participate? Yeah, the question was, is this open for outside investors? And we get that question a lot, and, and one of the initiatives we're pursuing is, how could we? And would Yvonne be open to accepting outside capital? Right now, from a structure perspective, this is pretty simple. We don't have to raise capital. Uh, with alignment, we can invest in the companies that align with our values. Uh, but we don't always have to report to outside investors, so there's a lot of structural differences if we were to t take outside capital. Uh, but we also realize that's where we might be able to move the needle, where we can maybe invest in later stage uh, companies or have a bigger fund because we do, you know, people do want to invest in this type of strategy. Um, so the answer to your question is right now we do not, but we do think that's a very possible next step for this fund as we kind of mature. Um, maybe one more. Uh, considering the Patagonia is the firm certified and 1% of the plan certified, do you all look for companies that have a similar certification for that sense before investing in Yeah, that's a good question. The question was about B Corps and 1% for the planet. Um, so we don't require our investments to be B Corps. It's an expensive accreditation and at, at this early stage, they can do a self-assessment and understand where they rank. Really, it's just an indicator, and we, we do like them to do that self-assessment, um, because it indicates like we care about these things. We do get a lot, while there's a lot of uh, good-hearted entrepreneurs, we do get a lot of people that we think might turn on the Patagonia setting when they talk to us, and they're just selling us versus it's not coming from their heart. And so one of the, again, one of the biggest challenges for me is identifying which entrepreneurs really are tied to the mission. If they get a billion dollars thrown at them from an oil and gas company maybe, are they gonna take that or are they, no, we wanna solve this problem the right way. And so uh, the other thing I'll mention is we're very long-term focused. So uh, one unique thing about our structure is while we want that financial return, we don't write about the exit in our investment criteria and in our investment term sheet. We realize that might come in different ways. It might come differently for different companies. So we don't wanna say in six years, we want you to go public. You might have that in your head as an entrepreneur, but we don't wanna drive to that just because that's how you get the highest financial return. Thanks, Alex. It's great. Yeah. So our next speaker is Carla, Carla Mora, who is running a fund that's taken outside investment. So let's a uh, slightly different approach. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carla Mora. Hi. <laughs> and I'm the founder and managing partner of Alante Capital. And Alante is a new impact investment venture capital fund that is investing uh, in new chemistries and technologies to empower a sustainable shift to a very large apparel and textile industry that you just learned all about. So thank you to Alex, that was really great and informative. Um, if I were to add to his video, it would be a lot of what we just, what he showed is a lot of what we're doing at Alante, and we're just doing it outside of a brand as an external fund vehicle. So we'll dive into a little bit more about Alante, but first, um, before that, they asked me to share a little bit about how I got into impact investing to begin with. So um, I'm from Santa Barbara and born and raised, left after I graduated high school, moved up to the Bay Area and got deeply committed to impact in general. We called it something else back then. Um, but I, I started my career as a development economist looking at how do we affect change and create stronger economies in emerging markets uh, by affecting the problems that are creating the, the challenges in those communities in the beginning. So after I graduated college, I went off and I worked on supply chain reform with the United Nations, looking at, at the coffee sector in particular and trying to understand how can we change the way that fair trade and organic coffee is produced so that it can be more cost competitive to regular coffee so that consumers, when you go into the store, 
will pick that fair trade organic coffee over the traditional because it's price competitive. So I spent some time really diving into that and uh, knew that that's really where my passion lied. I had a amazing professor. It's great to see all you students here tonight because really what set me on my track that started this career about 15 years ago was a great professor and um, some really exciting lectures about economic development. And the thing that got me the most fired up was this concept of negative externalities that the market was leaving behind. So how could we look at business and figuring out ways to internalize these externalities and actually create businesses that have a positive impact on both people and the planet? Is there a way that we can structurally change the way that the market works so that that's just the way the market runs? So after uh, about a eight or so years working on development economics um, with the UN. I worked in emerging markets, lived in Afghanistan for a while, working on uh, strengthening the economy there in Kabul and looking at how can we create linkages across the supply chain. Um, I was you know, sold that this was the approach I wanted to take, but I had started to hear the buzzword impact investing. And I was fascinated by this term because my career so far, the way that I thought that I could do good for the world was through the public sector supporting the private sector. And that was unique. A lot of my friends who were doing social good were working for nonprofits, and they were just in the public sector providing services to health services, education services, et cetera. But I was always really connected to the private sector approach, but from the public sector. And so when I started to hear about impact investing, social entrepreneurship, I got really excited about this concept that you can do business you can do business well and you can have a good social and environmental impact doing it. So uh, I was actually home in Santa Barbara, finishing up my report um, for my Afghanistan work. I collected all the data and asked my boss, can I please go home to Santa Barbara and write this? I'm done being on um, you know, house arrest in Kabul. <laughs> the danger is enough. So I came back to Santa Barbara, I'm writing up my report and I met somebody locally who ran an impact investment foundation. And they were putting on lectures like this in the community and he said, next week we're having one, come check it out. And I came um, and I listened, just like you in the audience, and I was just smitten, I was sold, I was so excited. They were passing out books. I picked one up, I went down to the coffee shop and I like read it all <laughs> in the next couple of days. And I emailed him and I said, I wanna work for you. And I still have my contract and I was supposed to move back to New York, they were gonna ship me off to Liberia for my next project. and. Uh, he said, well, we don't really have many positions, but you could work part-time as like admin. I was like, well, I don't know, but this is so compelling and I really was driven by this concept of impact investing and I really wanted to learn more about it. So I decided, yeah, I'm gonna take this leap of faith, do this, um, and I joined them. And that was with the Elios Foundation and that was about six years ago. Uh, and their local organization, it's a foundation that invests in emerging social enterprises or social enterprises in emerging markets. Very early stage, it was patient capital. They also accepted outside capital in and we would invest on a deal by deal basis into uh, early stage companies that were providing health services, education services in countries like Kenya, Liberia and India. So I did that for a while and it was really interesting, but I wanted to get back to those economic development roots. I felt like part of what I had been shifted into when I got into impact investing was creating these services for people living in extreme poverty because that was our mission, which was great. But I wanted to work on why are they living in extreme poverty? Is there ways that we can adjust the system so that they can lift themselves out of poverty? And so get back to that economic development roots and that system change kind of approach. So uh, I left San Santa Barbara and uh, moved up to, back up to San Francisco and spent some time running accelerator programs with a lot of emerging social enterprises across sectors from financial technologies, health tech, all over, um, just trying to understand and learn the different models and see where exactly I wanted to spend my time. I uh, was asked to come in and run a fund for a group called Village Capital and they had a fund up in San Francisco and at the time they were raising it. So the managing partner was going out on maternity leave. They needed someone to just come in and seamlessly take over for four months while we were raising our first fund. We had 36 plus companies already in the portfolio we were managing and in just four months I had to make six investments where we were the lead investor, um, including two of our very first follow-ons. And that was like a crash course in fund management. Do you actually like running a fund? Because there are lots of different careers you could take in impact investing and a lot of different kind of strategies to get there. And this was a really great experience for me in saying, actually, yeah, I like it. I like 
fundraising. I like working with lawyers a lot because that's a lot of what you do. Um, I love working with startups and trying to understand all of their, their problems and figure out how can we solve these problems together and make them successful. Uh, I like structuring the deals. So that was a great experience. And from that, um, I left there and began to think about Alante Capital. So I was doing due diligence for a company at Village Capital. They ended up winning our accelerator and ended up in our fund. Um, and it was a natural indigo dye company. And I thought, this is interesting. My, when I studied economics, my passion was really in agriculture and food security. And this was an agriculture play, but was within the apparel industry. And I was doing due diligence, and I thought, well, why is this so important? Like, why are people ever going to have natural indigo if it's more expensive? Why would they buy it? And I started to look in and started to uncover the enormous opportunity um, within the apparel industry. There was huge problems that I hadn't even realized were still there. You know, I remembered kind of the, the social issues that we'd heard about a lot in the 90s and in the early 2000s with like supply chain problems happening in, the, in child labor and the apparel industry, but I hadn't really understood the extent to which there were environmental problems. And in doing due diligence in this company, I started to uncover it and it was enormous. But one thing that struck me about this is I saw lots of companies, and it wasn't just companies like Patagonia and Eileen Fisher, but huge emerging or huge brands that are well known that were making commitments towards sustainability, that were uh, looking for sustainable innovations. It just seemed like the first time in my career in Impact that the industry I wanted to affect change in was ready to have that change happen. So that really inspired me to start this fund. So um, here we are. Uh, fast forward. Uh, couple years or so, year and a half, uh, and this is Alante Capital. So I'm the founder and managing partner. Um, my co-managing partner is Leslie Harwell. She's based out in New York, and our analyst is uh, somewhere in the audience, Jackson Scher over here. Hopefully you had a chance to chat with him from DC. Uh, and we all have different backgrounds within finance from different spaces. Um, and Leslie came from JP Morgan and Credit Suisse. She had a very traditional banking background, but a strong passion for sustainable apparel. And um, she was introduced to me early on. I convinced her to leave her sweet banking job and join the startup lifestyle of launching a new fund. Um, and it's been an incredible adventure ever since. She joined us about a year and a half ago. And we brought on Eileen Fisher, our third partner, uh, just in January this year. And Eileen, uh, if you don't know, Eileen Fisher is a designer who's had a brand by that name for the last 35 years. And for the last few decades, have been, she's been really focused on sourcing responsibly. So similar to Patagonia as being a leading voice in sustainable apparel, um, Eileen Fisher is as well. And she was attracted to working with us uh, because we were looking at approaching this industry not to try and scale the next brand that could be like Patagonia or Eileen Fisher, but how can we support more brands and apparel companies that are out there to begin to do better business practices? The things that Patagonia and Eileen Fisher have been focusing on, how can we invest in innovation to make that easier? So this kind of touches back on what I was talking about with like the apparel industry has huge, enormous problems with waste and resource uh, scarcity. And this is one of the big drivers to a lot of the large apparel brands that we work with now in wanting to find sustainable alternatives. So if you're an enormous company like a Levi's or a Gap that is heavily reliant on cotton, most of your garments are cotton, you have huge supply channels where you are selling this all over the world, you're concerned with the state of cotton being grown globally. You're concerned about changing climates, impacting growing seasons, impacting disease, impacting, you know, the, that any time that there becomes any scarcity in your supply, that's going to greatly impact the price of your input. So they're looking at, well, what else can we how can we diversify our dependence away from this one natural fiber? So even if it's not entirely always for sustainability up front, there's a business case to be made for diversifying and becoming less dependent on these single materials that the apparel industry relies on heavily. And so what we saw was there are huge problems. 25% of the chemicals used in the world are used in the apparel industry. It's incredibly wasteful, the pollution that goes into our water streams, 90% of it, or into the water, production of the apparel industry, 90% of that goes into the rivers where these garments are being manufactured. There's a 
kind of story in the apparel industry that says you can understand the color of the season by looking at the rivers in China where the products are produced because they will run with the shade of the season. Um, and, you know, that's an extreme idea, but it's, you know, there's images that show that to be true. And those dyes, those chemistries that we use to make sure our garments don't smell or don't, you know, wrinkle or the dye doesn't run out, those are heavily chemically intensive and chemically toxic. So we're looking at how can we invest in innovation to clean that up. We need to clean that up because 16.2 million tons of textile waste is discarded annually in the USA alone. So all of this garments that we're wearing all the time and buying so cheaply, sending to the goodwill, most of it is ending up in incinerators, and ending up in landfills, and all of that material made from polyester, which is plastic-based, it never breaks down. So like the issues with single-use plastics that we are all very well aware of, and we're very lucky, we live in Santa Barbara in a town that's conscientious about these issues, same problems are having, happening within the apparel industry when it comes to waste. What are we gonna do with all of this garbage? So this is a huge problem for the industry, but a huge opportunity for innovation. It's also a very labor-intensive industry, and so the heavy chemicals that uh, these garment workers are in touch with every day in these poorly ventilated factories has a terrible effect on their health, both in them as well as in the communities when they get released out into the rivers. So by being able to clean it up, clean up the chemicals, get better materials, we're also able to impact the lives of millions of people working within this space. Um, one thing that Patagonia helped to find out here at UCSB, so shout out to our local community, is they were able to uncover this enormous problem, this is the bad side, of um, microfiber pollution in our oceans. And I was able to go to UCSB last year to join a collective of brands from around the world. There were, Patagonia was there, Adidas and H&M, and everybody was there to learn about what are we gonna do about microfiber pollution. So these are the fibers coming out of our garments that are ending up in our oceans. The research has continued. They've recently found it in our tap water, in our agriculture, in our bodies, in our fish. So how can we start to look at exciting innovation that can allow the apparel industry to provide great garments that we want to buy as consumers, but that won't lead to pollution that ends up in our bodies and in our fish. Um, so we'll talk about some of those exciting opportunities next. So in the beginning, we had our industry pioneers, our early pioneers, Patagonia, Eileen Fisher, Stella McCartney, Toad & Co., if anyone here, that's another local company who's been doing great work for a couple decades. Um, and they have been pioneering this and saying this is important for a while. And that's great. And what else has been happening is there are a lot of emerging ethical fashion brands. People are afraid about investing in the apparel industry. They see the stores closing in the malls and in State Street. They don't know what's happening with retail. But retail is just changing. And it is changing fast. And people are still consuming at enormous rates. Way too much. <laughs> we really need to kind of tone that back a little bit, right? <laughs> and, um, they're just changing the way they shop. And a lot of these emerging ethical fashion brands are starting out ethical. They've taken note from big brands like Patagonia and they've started um, sourcing responsibly or having an impact early on. And they're selling not through brick and mortars, but they're selling online and able to reach consumers in the new way that consumers are shopping now. And these important brands, and there's tons of them more. Um, there's a few here, Adelante Shoes is here. Um, Nisolo Shoes is another local founder. Um, but these emerging brands help to drive the conversation with consumers and say, hey consumers, you can demand that it's possible to get products made that are beautiful and affordable and, and competitive and they're done well without harm. But what's really exciting to me and which is where we play most is in this mainstream adoption. So a huge part of our model is working with these brands. And all of these brands here are partners. We uh, work with them on a regular basis or their parent holding companies to understand kind of what are your challenges in actually reaching your sustainability commitments? What kind of innovation are you looking for? And then what is required for you to actually source this? What does the price point need to be? How does it need to fit into your supply chain? And they provide the same kinds of support to us as Patagonia's teams do to them when it comes to the material science, the supply chain, all of that. So we really lean a lot on the industry to say, hey, what do you need? We're here for you. We're trying to make it easier for you to do this better. And we've found that that kind of approach uh, has been really valuable for us because we get invaluable um, knowledge and understanding from them to be able to really vet 
and de-risk the companies we're going to work with. And then after we're able to look at investing, actually we do this often way before we even invest, is we connect those early stage companies to these brands so that they can go into wear testing and go into um, figuring out if they can go to market with these companies. So the last point on this is really, it's not just the sustainability pioneers doing this. The entire industry is focusing on this now. And more and more, we get more and more requests to work with us from the corporate brand side now that we actually have to not continue to work with them on a regular basis because we're tapped out with the brands that we do work with. Um, so it's really exciting because it shows that this is not just social and environmental, this is mainstream, this is happening, uh, and we're excited to be a part of it. So all these brands are seeking innovation to improve sustainability, maintain their positioning. So many startups are emerging. These brands are investing millions of dollars in business plan competitions, accelerator programs, all of the support to say, hey, innovation, we need you. You need to come solve our problems. And these startups that are emerging need capital. And so that's really where we fit in. So sustainability is poised to save the world. Innovation has to first save sustainability. So we are really looking at innovation. You don't have to read the fine print, but this is just an illustration of kind of how do we think about our investment approach. We don't invest in any brands. We invest in kind of the back end of the industry. How can we support brands to be able to produce better? So we look at production. What are the raw materials, dyes, finishing chemistries? How can we look at design? Um, how can we support design so that there is no waste left on the factory floors? There's been a lot of exciting innovation in that in footwear over the last few years. Um, so we look at all kinds of different exciting innovations there. Then we look at distribution. So how do these, once a product is made, how does it reach the market? Uh, how can they make sure that they're not massively overproducing? Can there better be, be better inventory management platforms and analytics to help them with demand forecasting? Um, On-demand production is emerging a lot. We're looking at fit technology so that once brands do start selling, a lot often it's e-commerce, right? So we're buying things online, we try a bunch on, they don't fit, we send them back. That's a lot of time wasted that they could have been sold and that's, that's a business loss for these, a lot of these brands. And so they're concerned about wanting to keep things um, in, in the market sold. Um, so then we look at sales. So once people do buy car garments and everything, how do they share them longer? keep them, do they have to own them? Is it, is it okay to have access? So there's emerging companies like Rent the Runway, and Black Tux that allow you to just share these garments. Huge, exciting things happening in secondhand space and uh, Alex already talked a little bit about that, but we invest in kind of those back-end systems looking at companies like Yertle that they use to help empower that. And then the last piece that we look at is the recycle piece. How can we actually break down these garments down to the molecular level, separate the fibers, and bring them back up so that those fibers can go back into making new garments so we don't have to rely on virgin polyester, virgin cotton, things like that. So we see innovation in startups all across this path. Uh, and we have a very big and robust pipeline that Jackson is always busy um, working through and having um, tons of interesting phone calls with inspiring entrepreneurs who are solving these issues. And because we decided to be, as a fund, single industry focused, because we're focusing on apparel and textile, a lot of the companies that we look to invest in can be in other industries, they're selling into automotive or they're gonna go into health, but as long as they're focused within apparel, we can add an enormous amount of value because we can connect them to Patagonia and Alex over at Tenshed, we can connect them to Adidas, we can connect them across the industry, um, and that makes us an attractive kind of value-added uh, investor, and we become a magnet to be able to receive this deal flow. And as a first-time emerging fund, that's vital. We have to make sure that we're able to be found by all of these startups, and are we able to find them? So we've been able to really position ourselves to have access to kind of everybody that's doing something within apparel because of our single industry focus. And that's how we've been able to partner with a lot of these big brands who see a lot of value as us being able to provide them the, the knowledge and the map of what are we seeing with innovation landscape. So not to get into this, but the way we have a very creative kind of approach to what types of companies we invest in, lots of different business models that provide different 
uh, return projections with different time frames that allow us to have the diversification we need, but within a single industry. And that's a creative approach. And so when we were building this fund, I really wanted to make it as plain vanilla as possible. This is a traditional venture capital fund. And that is really important to me when we're going out to have conversations with our investors, that they can look at it and say, yeah, yeah, I get that. I understand that quick. And then we can spend time doing the due diligence where the diligence is most valuable on the types of companies we're going to be investing in. So within impact investing, there's a lot of creativity and finance that can come up, but we chose to go on the side of as normal as possible. Um, so that's our typical fund structure. So our typical VC fund, but impact is at the core of everything we do. So we, every single company we look at, um, it has to be impacting the planet or people in a better way. And we really look for the companies that it's tied to their business model. So one of the companies we're excited about and looking at now, for example, they make a biodegradable alternative to polyester. So they actually make the fiber, and it's made in a really exciting way that has very low impact on the environment, and the industry can be really excited about. Like, those are the types of companies where impact is so intrinsically tied in the business model that it's easy for us to track and measure over time. Um, so it's a typical fund. It's a small fund. So we're looking at making about 17, 15 to 18 investments, and then a number of follow-on investments uh, over the next... 10 years, it's a 10 year fund. Um, and besides capital, we provide the support of market access. So this is the primary. We help them raise money, we measure and track the impact, we make sure that they're investable, and then we really connect them to the market and that's how we can stand out as an investment fund and really attract the ability to be able to invest in these incredible entrepreneurs. So we do that uh, with a great board of advisors who support us. Um, we have the head of sustainable innovation for Caring Group, one of the biggest luxury groups in the world. Um, we have uh, James from Appeal Sciences to be able to lean on that local knowledge of material uh, engineers and chemists. So that's very exciting. But we have Gordon also from Toad & Co, Zohar from <laughs> Decker. So that you'll see some local faces, but we also have people from around the world that are really focused on helping impact environmental change within the industry. So um, I'll stop there. That's Alante. And if you have any questions, let me know. Carla, that was great. We probably have time for about maybe five minutes worth of questions. OK. So for uh, mainstream or corporate businesses, do you have to, is it, do you have to present more than just a financial benefit for them in order to see the value? Or do they already know that this is where the world is moving? Like how, how can you kind of convince them that sustainability? Oh, we don't. So we um, work, that's the exciting thing about this industry is that the mainstream companies, the big ones that we were listing there already have bought into the fact that this is very important to them and it's important to their bottom line. It's important to how they think they're going to remain relevant to their consumer base. So we've been very selective with what apparel companies and brands we work with. Um, and so how we do it is we work with a team, so we get buy-in from their, their executive level uh, across departments, and then we'll work with their innovations department, material science department, sustainability department, and we work with them on a, about a quarterly basis to make sure that we can help support them, but they already have to have buy-in so that once they've looked through the innovation, they will actually be able to bring it to market. So we don't want to act as a teacher to a lot of these big companies about why they should care. We just are working with the ones that do, and that market alone is enormous. So that's an exciting thing. Totally. <laughs> yeah. We do. We 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 work it with some of the campuses. I have a, some awesome students right here from UCSB that I'm mentoring, and they've been supporting us. So we work. I personally work with the Bren School um, and the groups that are coming out that are working within apparel, and then we do speak at some of the universities because we like to share with them. This is what the market is looking for. These are the kinds of innovations um, to help spur that innovation from the earlier stages. And MIT also, actually, we have we work directly with them. Uh -huh. <laughs> Think about what issues we can solve. So 
Um, durable water uh, repellency, if you can find sustainable alternative to how we waterproof stuff. I think a lot of brands would be really excited about that. Um, that's a big one. I think that's one of the bigger ones. I think um, performance materials, fibers, to be able to provide the fiber new fibers that can come out and be biodegradable or be able to break down but have the attributes of high performance so you can still wear it while you're climbing a mountain or going to yoga, that's another thing. So that's why we're excited about the biopolyester and there's some other chemistries and alternative um, materials that we're seeing in that space, but that's compelling. Yeah. Anyone else? Isn't the cannabis industry going to play a major part in the apparel? Sorry, the cannons? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's actually the company that I'm advising right here. It's called Biscus. You should chat with them afterwards. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of waste created from the cannabis in industry and that can go into both hemp fiber as well as uh, man-made cellulosic fiber, which is viscose. So it's a fiber that we're all wearing. Probably half the room has it, even if you don't know it. Um, but yeah, the, the cannabis waste coming out of that industry is going to be able to play a role. So we're really watching it and it's, it's exciting. Oh. Yes, a ton. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Oh, Bob. How do you see uh, kind of potential rivals go in and work with you and collaborate on something that could be seen as a competitor in the world? Totally. Um, yeah, so we're very upfront with all of our brands that we are working with all of the brands. <laughs> That's important day one that, you know, it, we have. we have the ability to like sign NDAs with them so we don't share any industry knowledge, we don't share any information about pricing or about what product they're going to go to, but we really play a negotiator. So if you're going to go to market with Adidas, then maybe if that chemistry also works for a brand like Eileen Fisher or Stella McCartney, that's a non-competitive consumer group, then you can go to market with both of them. We get to have a lot of those conversations around exclusivity, which is a great position to be in to help brands think about it and help our startups um, approach it, because it, it can be scary going to a huge customer and having to have those conversations. I think Pro. that's time. Yeah, I, I know okay. you're so passionate about this. Cool. You could talk about this all night long, but that was great. <laughs> okay. um, as mentioned, I'm Jenny Dew. I'm with Appeal Sciences, and I'm excited to come and talk to you for a few reasons. One is to um, just showcase the great work of our really talented team. Second is to provide an update to our many supporters uh, in the community here in the audience today, and also hopefully to inspire some of the younger folks in the audience, We've our high school students and our college students, um, so I'll start off just um, appeal staff, may you please stand up and uh, just be recognized for a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous for us to stand up here and not acknowledge um, everyone's contributions because it really, uh, we couldn't do it without um, everyone. So we have representation from our R&D teams, uh, operations, marketing, finance. Uh, I think that's everybody, but yeah. Um, so if you have any additional questions that I can't answer today, please come find one of our team members and they'd be happy to address that too. Um, and to our community of supporters, um, again, it takes a village. We've got from our employment lawyers to our tax consultants and our architects in the, in the office. Uh, it's just really fun to have had you support us over the time um, that we've been growing. And to the young, uh, younger crowd, I would say we're here as accidental uh, an impact company. <laughs> we just saw an important problem that we felt needed to be addressed um, and wanted to go after that. And uh, I myself, I would say, an, an accidental entrepreneur um, until James, uh, whose face was shown on uh, the previous slide, so it's a perfect segue, but he had quoted, it was kind of cliche, but Steve Jobs uh, saying that just once you realize that the world around you is created by people no smarter than you, uh, but it was more about those who are willing to make, take a chance and, and push the boundaries a little bit, that um, much of that has come to fruition. Um, that's really like how we got into this. And so anyways, hope that you sit in the crowd and, and don't count yourself out as um, being somebody who could initiate a, a next big change. So. I'll just tell you a little bit, uh, for those who don't know Appeal Sciences, we'll tell you a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve, uh, what inspired us to go down this path, uh, our approach, 
and um, the progress that we've made to date. Um, so basically, by 2050, uh, with how much our population across the globe is expected to grow, um, it's estimated that we'll need 55% more water and 70% more food in order to support that growing population. Um, but agriculture as a whole already um, is a major consumer of our resources. 80% of our uh, fresh water goes to agriculture. 30% of the energy, and also um, a big contributor to our total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it, it's, it's a hard world out there, pests <laughs> of all kinds, climate. <laughs> um, and so it actually does require, um, for example, pesticides in order to uh, sustain um, our food supply. Um, and yet with all of those inputs that have to go in to create the amazing food that we all um, have the opportunity to eat, um, we throw a lot of it away. Um, and in fresh fr fruits and vegetables, which is the space in which we focus, um, it can be, some people will say a third, 40%, um, up to half of what we grow uh, is never consumed. And so when you see that there's challenges with regards to just productions and yields, um, you know, how much more can we really pull out of the soil? Uh, maybe an alternative would be to look at how do we throw less of that away. And so uh, when, so when this um, problem kind of first came to light, um, I think something that we were all pretty naive about, about the scale of the, the food waste challenge, um, it was like, wait, how, how do we preserve food now, or how do we protect it now? And after all the time in which we've been growing this food, refrigeration and controlled atmosphere are among our, basically our primary um, technologies that we rely on. Um, and so that's where being totally kind of naive, highly optimistic and idealistic, coming to agriculture from material science and chemistry, knowing nothing about plants and the food supply chain, you just go like, isn't there a better way? I don't know. <laughs> um, and so to look for inspiration, uh, we, we turn to nature. And so how do plants protect themselves now? Um, all of us, you know, all, everything was underwater at some point in geological history. And in order to um, come onto the surface, um, we had to basically develop a peel or a cuticle. Um, and so it is basically inspiration of reinforcing or, uh, yeah, reinforcing the peel is basically the, the idea that we're, we're looking at here. So taking materials that are found in plants already, the ones that they already use to protect themselves, can we repurpose them on the surface of fresh produce to extend their shelf life? Um, so I'll just play a little video. Um, so, on the, so rather than just tell you, um, our time-lapse videos have been our most powerful way to share with folks how, um, that, I guess, the impact of the product. So always on the left side, we have produce that's untreated, um, and on the right-hand side, produce that has um, our materials applied on top. And these are at room temperature, um, just on your tabletop, um, and then you'll see the day counter in the middle there. So we've looked at um, a few different kinds of produce, so fruits and vegetables, uh, those that might take extra time to ripen, like an avocado, um, in this case a mango, um, tomatoes, um, and tomatoes are super exciting for us also because we see the opportunity to maybe harvest them later, where they would have more flavor and, and a higher nutrient content um, rather than arriving to you um, green and, and flavorless. Um, citrus is really amazing because it has a thick peel already, so citrus is among some of that more um, robust produce that's in our homes already, but with added peel from a peel, um, we can extend its shelf life further. This is a different kind of avocado. Haas avocados are the ones that are typically in the grocery store, and those are fuerte avocados. Um, and berries, I think everyone can relate to the problem of bringing a carton of berries home and, and before you can really get through them all that you have to throw them away. Um, so how does it work? Um, and so we went you know, to the idea of reinforcing the peel. And what its purpose is, is to create a physical barrier uh, that, ex that keeps water uh, on the inside, moisture on the inside and also reduces um, oxygen that's in the atmosphere that can come in and kind of, uh, I would say, like, you know, chew up the, uh, the inherent materials. So um, 
plants breathe, just like we all here breathe. Um, and so if you can slow down how much oxygen it's exposed to, it's um, another way to, to kind of trick it into um, lasting longer as well. So it really is just a physical barrier applied in order to retain moisture and reduce exposure to oxygen in the atmosphere. So a little bit, I guess, tied to the, um, the, the theme that we're here for today. Um, this is James, uh, a younger James, um, a few years ago now, uh, when he won the New Venture competition at UCSB. Um, and at that time, you're like a student, so you're like, $5,000! <laughs> and then you realize, by the time you incorporate the company, the money is gone. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> so, so where do you go from there? <laughs> um, and so with the technology and the area that we're um, wanting to play in, um, we actually came across an opportunity from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to get some grant funding. Um, and so they were really our first funder. Um, they had uh, a Grand Challenges Exploration Program where they try to tackle some of the most important problems um, facing all of us around the world. They could range from maternal health um, to neonatal health. I think most people know about their vaccines and um, program and, and also a goal to, for example, eradicate um, malaria. But they also had a program that was focused on um, reducing post-harvest lost and waste in sub-Saharan Africa. And so it was a proposal to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that helped us um, earn our first $100,000 seed grant. And uh, we've just kind of built it out from there. Um, since that time, so that was uh, 2002 is when that grant uh, was awarded, late 2002. This particular check is from 2003. <laughs> I joined uh, July 2013. Um, as uh, James's first employee. And since that time, uh, we've now grown to be 115 staff here, uh, mostly in Santa Barbara. Um, and although we don't have our product in the stores here in California yet, uh, we've been working with um, avocado and citrus packers. So Eco Farms is down in Temecula, Del Rey Avocado Company. They do have um, a pack house here in Fallbrook but we work with them at their Vineland, New Jersey location in Horton Fruit Company in Louisville, Kentucky. And so appeal treated avocados are currently available um, at Harps Grocery Stores um, in Kansas, Arkansas area, Costco in Michigan, uh, and Kroger in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. Um, and so hopefully coming to our lo locally available for us here soon. Um, but it's been really exciting because what we've been able to, we came out with saying like we could reduce food waste and uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, but once you start to actually break it down, it's been really exciting to see all the different nodes in the supply chain, all the stakeholders in the supply chain and how we've been able to add value. So we'll start with the end consumer. All of us in this, on this room are end consumers. And so the idea is can you um, take produce that, for example, uh, maintains the nutrient levels to a greater extent um, that also would taste better because those same compounds, the chemicals that are in our plants um, already that contribute to flavor are also um, preserved or extended with time um, and that you can eat it before you have to throw it away. But if you kind of move back in the supply chain, what we've been able to see is that with our first few programs, what I showed on the previous slide, um, is that we've been able to, in some cases, slash the, the amount of produce that they've had to throw away, the avocados, by 65%. Um, and, um, and thank you. <laughs> 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 um, and at the same time, actually boost their sales. Um, so that's, that's, those are the benefits that we're seeing um, to the retailers. Retailers is what in the produce industry we refer to as your grocery stores. Um, for many of our uh, distributors, um, pack houses aren't really our true producers, um, but think about, for example, um, citrus or apples. They're actually going to storage for a very long time. And so sometimes you wonder, you know, is all the benefit going to be accrued to your retailers and your consumers? What about folks that are earlier on in the supply chain? Um, if you put lemons or apples into storage for months, um, and they're losing water, and you have a 
uh, produce packer who's going to take a bin of, for example, lemons, and they're going to have to fill 25-pound boxes with them afterwards. There's basically, they've lost weight in that storage time. And so what they could have filled before, maybe it's only, call it, you know, 100 of those 25-pound um, boxes by uh, use of our product, they might actually be able to fill, um, you know, maybe 110, 120 boxes with that same um, starting load. Um, and then same thing kind of to our producers. Um, producers and distributors, I would say, some similar challenges that they face there with regards to um, loss or what's called shrink uh, in, this, in the supply chain. Um, and we're also really excited. Um, for example, asparagus is air flown often from Latin America into the US in order to get to us uh, fresh. Um, is there a way to, to, for example, shift that to marine transport rather than air, air freight um, as a way to not just uh, reduce cost uh, to, the, to the producer or the distributor, um, but also a major, major impact on the environmental footprint there. Um, what's not shown on this slide is all the work that's done upstream, so in our own, um, in our own appeal house. Um, and so using some of the tools that some of the other speakers here have um, talked about as far as, for example, life cycle analysis and looking at the impacts of the processes that we've developed to date, where we'd like to take them in a next generation or next version, and seeing how the benefits that um, we've been able to provide to the supply chain um, are offset by, you know, the footprint maybe of the product itself, um, as just as one of those examples. But um, I was kind of intentionally keeping this short so that we could have a chance to entertain questions either to me and, and to our speakers. Um, so with that, I'll close and thank you for your time. Questions for Jenny about <laughs> appeal? Hello. Hi, Paul. Good. Thank you for the presentation. I'm curious about Hmm, good question. So with regards to washing it off, um, if it washed off easily, it wouldn't actually be a very good barrier. Um, so it has, you know, the materials that we've very purposely chosen are the ones that are found in the food that we already eat. And so if you've eaten some cheese today or had a tablespoon of olive oil or bit into an apple, um, you've already eaten a lot of the material that we would be using. Um, so it's not, in, it's not intended to be washed off. It was, it was made and intended to be eaten. Um, but with regards to then, you know, d what is the impact with regards to, let's say, like behavior in, the, you know, behavior of that produce in your home? Um, that's where those fun, weird, and those weird little tricks like being able to put it in that paper bag because you're able to, you know, is it, is it temperature that can help accelerate? Is it um, ethylene exposure, for example, for the avocados that help? But what's really, really amazing, and we didn't know this going into this, that not every avocado is made the same. So when you go to Costco, you buy a bag of avocados, and they're, you know they're going to be hard, and you know they're going to be hard for a really, really long time. And it's because those uh, avocados were never pre-triggered with ethylene in order to start the ripening process. And so Costco shoppers have been trained, whether you know it or not, to go to Costco and buy these avocados that you know you'd have to wait a little bit longer for, um, versus um, when you buy them loose or bulk at the grocery store, like a Kroger or a Ralph's or something like that, um, where you expect, you go in because you need them that day, and so they've actually been ripened to a later state so that you can use them in your home. So for us, um, if, if you're getting an appeal avocado from a Kroger or a Costco, uh, not Costco, but from a Kroger, um, they've gotten to you in that ripened state, but the benefit that we provide is that rather than, you know, like I think everyone's seen it in memes. It's like, not ready, not ready, not ready, ready. And it's like, the avocado's done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, now with that ready window, um, you get an extra couple days out of it, and you actually will have a chance to enjoy and use that avocado um, in whatever recipe you'd like. Hello. Uh, who's, who's applying the, uh, the appeal? Is it producers? Or are you guys in between the producers and the distributors? Sir, so you said who applies it? Yeah, we apply it. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we have um, a whole 
crew of field service staff. Um, so uh, what's, I think, unique about um, what we're doing is rather than provide product and we just hand it over um, to folks that we provide the equipment um, in order to spray and uh, convey and dry. Um, and also, the, you know, the staff that are there to operate that equipment and also ensure quality. Um, and we also will hold back um, samples from each, um, many of the lots that we treat in order to monitor to make sure that um, the, the brand promise that we've put forward is what we actually deliver to the stores. Mm -hmm. Hello. Same question. I was, just, um, I was just wondering if you were going to go into maybe the sell that to individual people. So if we went to the farmers market, we bought something you know, on the table, and we were able to that uh, production related, or is it always going to be like a big companies? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. That was something that came up to us even very early on in the company's um, like history. Um, and I think what we were concerned about was just more quality and adoption. Um, if you give something to somebody like a little bit works well, you know, could it, there's, is there opportunity for misuse in the home where you say, if a little bit works well, then a lot works a lot better. And then you have a negative experience and you go, ah, oh, man, this appeal stuff doesn't work. Um, so we would love to move towards something like that. Um, so what's really exciting is beyond addressing large-scale commercial growers is to create what we're calling a self-service system. And so the majority of the farmers in the world are actually smallholder farmers. Um, and they're not, not going to have access to you know, a big pack house and maybe um, the resources to invest in that kind of capital equipment. And so can you get it to really like as easy as, you know, effectively like a sugar packet kind of thing that you can tear up and mix up in water and be able to just hand dip and set out to dry? Um, so the mango um, that was in the time-lapse video was actually done by that kind of method um, in Kenya as part of one of our demonstrations uh, with our Gates Foundation-related work. And um, so we're excited to make the technology robust enough that it really actually could succeed in that kind of very highly distributed um, uh, like channel, I guess, um, so to speak in hopes that we can reach a, a much, much broader population. Um, but we're starting right now by trying to demonstrate the value of the technology uh, with these larger scale partners um, at this time. Other questions? <laughs> uh, yes? The nutritional value of the fruit and vegetables preserved as well. Yeah, so I think it's, a, it's an interesting question because Nutritional value can be macronutrients, micronutrients, and it's different maybe what you're looking for in each of those different kinds of produce, but we'll use an example from blueberries. So blueberries you might eat because they're high in vitamin C and high in these antioxidants. And so by applying um, our materials to, that, uh, to those blueberries and comparing them against untreated blueberries over time, you'll see that those vitamin C levels are maintained at a higher uh, level than the ones that are untreated because of the ability to, you don't want to totally block out oxygen because you're going to choke the produce off and then it develops off flavors because it starts to ferment and so on and so forth. But you do reduce the exposure um, and so then your antioxidants aren't oxidized. <laughs> yeah. If you can, if you got a question, raise your hand and we'll get you a microphone because this is all being recorded on TV. So if you're speaking without the microphone, nobody can hear on the TV, so that's why we want, just wait for us, we'll get to you. So raise your hand and we'll, we'll happy. Violets. Hello. Hi, Hi Jenny. Um, we're very fortunate here in Santa Barbara that we have access to organic, organic, and organic, and mm -hmm. that's how I eat. Mm -hmm. um, but even up and down through the farmer's market, there are farmers that are not organic or not sustainably grown. Mm -hmm. So, how does your product um, differ or not used on organic or non-organic and does it affect the taste of something like asparagus where you eat the whole thing versus an avocado where you peel it? Yeah, great questions. Um, so, I think it would be foolish of us to not recognize the impact and the growth of the organic sector um, with, ac across the fresh produce industry especially. Um, and so we have uh, variations of our formulations that are allowed for use on organic produce. 
Um, and so reviewed by the uh, Organic Materials Review Institute, so that farmers who have organic produce um, can, can, can use um, our product as a post-harvest protection tool and retain their organic status. Um, with regards to uh, the flavor, um, so the amounts of materials that are used are so little, um, and again, it's, um, it's like lipids or like natural fats that are found in our diet already. Um, so when we've done you know, our own tests and also actually third-party uh, third panel taste tests um, of fresh produce like strawberries, um, the flavor is unaffected. Mm -hmm. Back to the vest. <laughs> I should have spoke to you earlier, but I got tied up on that side. Uh, curious, being here at Santa Barbara and Central Coast Company, why? Uh, what are the barriers to you having a greater impact in California? You seem to be spread all out, all around the nation. Say, sorry, just say that one more time. Well, it seems you don't have as large a footprint here in California, and I'm mm -hmm. curious, what are the barriers to market here? Yeah. Um, we would love to have a footprint in Santa Barbara because it would make our logistics so much easier <laughs> from a staffing perspective. Um, so a lot of it has just been who's been willing to adopt um, our products first. Um, and so we've, um, we've been in conversation with many of the, the regional pack houses here, for example, um, but the, the most aggressive movers have been the ones um, that we've kind of called out there before. So their relationships and the dialogues are continuing, and I think we're excited that um, there could be some opportunities for us in 2019 to be able to operate right here in our own backyard um, and being able to, for example, offer um, produce in the grocery stores right here. Yeah. We'll go here, then here, and then maybe someone back there. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. I uh, just had a quick question about the uh, impact on the unit economics. What is it currently, and how do you see that changing over time? Um, environmental impact perspective, or? Well, the cost. Dollars. So how much cost. does it cost to apply now, and what impact does it have on the produce today, and yeah. do you see that trend decreasing over time? Sure. Um, so I think we, so I think what we, Pricing is a funny thing because we don't actually price on a per kg of material basis. We price based on the value and the savings that we believe we can deliver to that, um, that category, that produce category. So what, um, using some of our retailers as an example, um, their competitive advantage or their position to the end consumer is actually to compete on price. And so for them, being able to say, pay for our product, but reduce their operating cost by a much larger um, portion, and also seeing that they're gaining in their sales, they're actually wanting to uh, share in those savings with the end consumers. Um, so that's sort of like one such example, um, but we've really, um, our strategy team's done an amazing job of really trying to price it such that there was value um, to be gained by the retailer and uh, by the supplier, and that there was, um, yeah, like opportunity in both. Um, without, without, I think, very um, consciously not wanting to create sort of like a premium or like a niche product. So a peel-treated produce shouldn't be um, the more expensive option in the grocery store since that kind of goes against what we're trying to do, which is make more fresh produce available to more people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think up here. Yeah. Is this one? Yeah. Um, you may have already covered this with the avocado question, but um, I'm, I, I'd like a little more, a clearer sense of what do you do about the logistics of, you know, when you go into the supermarket, if you buy at the supermarket stone fruit, for example, peaches mm -hmm. and nectarines are notorious for never being, they're just never ripe. In the, mm -hmm. I, I, and I guess it's similar to, to the avocado, but the logistics with the growers of when you come into the process, they need to now let things ripen further, correct? Is that? Is they that, don't have to, but they can. Yeah. What, is, mm -hmm. is there, what, what's the difference between the spoilage issue and the ripening issue? And are they, I assume there's big correlation between the, t the two of them. So just to make sure I understand your correction or your question correctly. Um, 
Well, the evolution of going from unripe to spoiled. Yes. You pass through perfect, uh, perfectly for, ripe. perfect for eating. Yes. So um, do the growers have to adopt, like, they have to change their logistics mm -hmm. of when they're actually putting, getting the fruit out to market? I see, I see. Um, so fortunately, not. And it's kind of weird because we would think of it as like a set trajectory, but with tricks like refrigeration, we pause, we effectively pause stuff. And with tricks like temperature and concentration maybe of ethylene or just time, you know, um, for, some, for some people you might say, oh, does that sound disruptive to tell somebody you might need you know, a few extra hours to ripen uh, that avocado all the way, a treated avocado versus one that's untreated. Um, but what we also are able to give is folks a little bit more time to actually store and, and buffer to a certain extent. So we have some of the um, pack houses as an example where their turnover is like constant and they're just sort of like, man, we've, we've got to get our timing like bang on and there's just no room for error. Um, but with, and that's because they need to get it to a very ripened state to get it out the door, for example. Um, and that the timing there is, is much more precise. Uh, whereas using our product on, um, on that produce, you basically get a little bit more of a buffer time. It's more forgiving. Um, and so in some crop categories, it's, it's actually a benefit uh, to them that is unforeseen. Uh, but once we get a chance to understand their supply chain and their logistics uh, more precisely, that we're able to actually work with them to figure out um, how to do it in a way that is not just minimally disruptive, but um, hopefully of benefit to them as well. Yeah, I think there was somebody back in the... Oh, hello. <laughs> just about branding. Mm. I mean, are you currently staying stealth, or are you looked at, I, I want the product to have the Appeal logo, and how do consumers react to it? Have you looked at that aspect about yeah. having an Appeal Yeah, our marketing product? team's going like, I love it when this question's asked. <laughs> um, so I think in the spirit of transparency, you know, we want, because I think most folks maybe don't realize that a lot of our produce is waxed, for example. Um, so what we've said is, here's a product that we're proud to stand behind, and we want you to know that that thing um, that you purchased has a peel on it. Um, and so if you go to um, one of those stores that is carrying um, our produce right now, it carries an appeal mark on it. Um, and so that is where um, the, as far as you know, value, not just to um, the end consumer, you know, hopefully they're excited about what we stand for and what we're trying to accomplish, um, and that they can see the value that um, once they bring that into their homes. Um, but we hope that it's a differentiator for that produce um, across a sort of a, a sea of aggregated produce in the in the retail store, and that that is one of uh, one of the drivers that a retailer might um, seek to to partner uh, with us for, um, and the same thing for the supplier. So I think the the brand recognition is something um, that's actually really important to us and something that we've been very forward with. Um, so yeah, all appeal produce is marked as appeal treated. Thank you, Jenny. It's great. Thanks. <laughs> so we have about ten more minutes, and we've heard from each of the um, each of the uh, presenters today, kind of in responding to your specific questions about their specific business. But we'd like to take advantage of the last couple of minutes, maybe if you have questions that you want to address to the full panel, and. I'll take the liberty of being up here to take the first. So, um, you know, Carl and Alex, you are investing in impactful companies. Jenny, you work in an impactful company. Could you talk a little bit about how impact is part of your corporate culture, your corporate DNA, and how you actually practice that in your day-to-day -day jobs? I just finished talking, so you guys go ahead. Can <laughs> <laughs> sure. I go first? Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, corporate culture has been something that's really important to us. Since it was just me, <laughs> I actually had a company culture document that I had written out um, when it was just me, <laughs> before there was anybody else, but in thinking of what kind of values do we want to have internally, how do they come out in practice, what are our expectations, what kind of communication style, so that we could hire according to that. So when I brought on my um, partner, 
I gave it to her and said, Can, this is my baseline and let's build on it together. And so she came in and we added and talked about values and uh, you know everything. So it was really important for both of us to create a company that would work with the kind of life and vision we had for ourselves. And um, so we really started with company culture from the very beginning. And the second piece to that is that we're in the process of becoming a B Corp. So that's exciting and that's a very uh, thorough process of internally looking within on what kind of benefits are you gonna be able to provide and all that stuff. So that's important to us. Yeah, I spoke a little bit about our, our company culture. You might be aware of it at Patagonia. We have our mission statement that we follow closely, specifically tied to our investments. I was really excited when I got to the company that it wasn't just we are looking at investments, for-profit investments that might have an environmental twist, and then at the end, we pull in the environmental team and the social team to say, okay, check, check, and we're good to go. Really, from that first conversation we have with an entrepreneur, we ask, you know, what's the problem you're solving? Why are you tied to it? Why do you care about this issue? And then it's almost like the fifth or sixth conversation where we start digging into the financials and the, you know, build out the models and do all that standard investment stuff. So I think it's just, it was reassuring that that's the process we use for the investments and it ties very much to the overall company culture. Um, I think back to us being like an accidental or not a knowingly like impact company. <laughs> um, I think it just really is a reflection of um, the values within our team members that like to do things the right way um, period is to do it in a way that um, respects a lot of the, the pillars that have been um, introduced by our other speakers here. Um, and it's been an amazing, I, like we get folks who come in, I'm always like astounded every day, the, the kind of talent that not just we attract but are actually able to hire and then convince them to move across the country and come to Santa Barbara and, and that was there was a time when it was like, we were just like 400 square feet in a corner <laughs> and getting people to, to do that. Um, and so we have, it's, a, it's, it's amazing because it brings in folks who, who share those same values right from the get-go. And so the dialogue day-to-day -day at the office isn't um, treating our business or is separate from um, some of these greater um, like sustainability and environmental values and, and just be a good human. <laughs> um, and so we see it, I think, just woven into the fabric of, of who we are. That's awesome. Questions from the floor? Thank you. Great presentation. I was just wondering about the breadth of different kinds of impact um, that there are investment opportunities for. If I were, say, to be an early stage company with potential for great impact in, say, noise pollution mitigation. How do I find the, um, the impact investor who's interested in that, other than Googling them, for, for example? And is there a breadth of impact out there, or is it mainly humane and sustainability issues? Well, I'll take that question first, if you don't mind. If you Google um, impact investing Santa Barbara, Sustainable Change Alliance is going to pop up. Um, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of um, angel groups in town. Uh, the founder of one is sitting back here. Um, our group is doing this kind of stuff. So there's a number of organized angel groups that are definitely looking for these kinds of investments. There aren't a whole lot of dedicated uh, funds in town. You probably met the, the you know pretty much the universe the universe uh, right now. But Santa Barbara is an interesting town from an investment perspective because many, many, many of the companies that are starting up here do have impact, and I'll use the word lowercase impact, as kind of part of their ethos from, from day one, as, as Carla said, literally before you have another employee. We also actually have a fair amount of money sloshing around the system here, and it's just simply a question of trying to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 marry, to marry the two. But, it, but a lot of things are getting done. Um, I'm not sure if you want to share kind of the growth of valuation of appeal because that might be private, but you, you, you've gone from a small company with a, with a, a couple thousand dollar grant from uh, Bill and Melinda Gates to a company that's worth a, a, a lot of money. Um, and so it's possible to, to take that money early stage, find investors who believe in you and grow it to a very attractive valuation. I'll just, I'll, I'll follow up on that quickly. Is, um, there's investors around the country and around the world where it's similar to philanthropy where they might tie to a specific issue and their whole investment thesis might be solving ocean waste. And there's actually a new fund out there right now that just launched that's doing exactly that. And then there's other fund managers that are saying, you know, 
environment broadly is what we want to support, and they just take that bigger approach. So I like to think of it, and I hope more institutional investors think of it as just a strategy, not just that I want to do this, this good thing that might have uh, reduced returns. You know, I really think it's a strategy that people should see it that way. So next question. Um, you guys are all talking about economic viability affecting change. Do you guys foresee public policy helping you change, like go further in that direction or hindering pulling you back? Both. <laughs> um, yeah, could you talk can, more about that? Yeah, I can really do both things. I think one current issue right now in apparel um, is the microfiber pollution issue. And there's concern around if there will be any regulation and what would that look like to the future of synthetic fiber or natural fiber. There's so many questions and it's a business concern and we need solutions in case that gets to that point. It will take time. But another is um, biosynthetic or uh, you know, bioengineered products. So we were looking at some really interesting um, biosynthetic dyes coming out of Europe, but there were genetically modified organisms officially and there were some bans and restrictions coming out of Europe that were about that and labeling. And so there's a lot of impact that government policy can have, whether it's in stopping it and accelerating it, or in just um, having to add layers of education for consumer perception. So to better understand what does that mean. So it always plays a role. Yeah, what gets me excited about the innovation side is speed. We can move faster. And even an early stage company with the right support, right funds, uh, they can move faster than policy sometimes can. But there's an example where policy can also get in the way. China just said, we don't want any old clothing. Um, we don't want your garbage, essentially. And mm -hmm. some of the projects we're working on are recycling innovations that take place in China. So right now, we have issues getting stuff into the country. And that's a huge bummer, because we want to do good stuff with it. It has value. But now we have to educate China on why does this have value. Like, we, you know, we're still kind of concerned there. So it, like you said, it's both. Mm -hmm. And from Appeal's perspective, um, fortunately, fruits and vegetables are things that most people want you to eat more of. Um, we're trying to figure out how to get more of kids, you know, to eat that or make that accessible um, across these f uh, food deserts and, and such. Um, so that's where it's, it's positive for us. Um, we haven't, fortunately ourselves, yet bumped up against um, specifically negative issues. You know, we, we just need to work our way through the regulatory approvals and every new geography we need to get into. but. Um, for actually March's uh, MIT Enterprise Forum event, we'd like to, one of the topics we'll feature is cultured meat. So I think just thinking about technology um, and its place in solving a lot of these important problems, um, but you know, is, is policy evolving um, at, at a rate that's gonna allow uh, some of those to have the impact that they, that they could have um, in, in, of course, like a safe way, so. Question regarding Santa Barbara and you guys being a Goleta-based company and a Ventura-based company, what are, what are some of the, Santa Barbara's finally getting traction as far as a place to be an entrepreneurial hub, Ventura. What, what are you guys finding as far as attracting key talent, your, your team here, UCSB, you know, we're kind of really getting some traction. You don't have to go to, to Silicon Valley or down to Los Angeles or somewhere else. How is that affecting in the growth of your company? and using technology to expand what Appeal is doing. You guys don't need to create everything here. You can send your technology around the world. So talk a little bit about that. Um, so for us, Santa Barbara, this is like not news to people who live in Santa Barbara. It's a really special place. <laughs> and so if you can um, attract talent here, they, you know, it's great. They share in a long-term vision, not just of the organization, but of what it means to be a part of this community. Um, I think what's been really great is that, um, you know, with some of our counterparts and friends in the Bay Area, it actually is like a really different kind of environment. Like, it's your people, are, you're poaching from each other constantly. You don't really have um, that strong retention. Um, and so we're in a different kind of place where we're able to attract this talent, leverage um, the talent that's right here in the university, the resources that are there, um, but then a really strong tech community um, to actually, I would say, like lay down some of these more like long-term roots um, for us to actually focus then on just building the organization. So that's uh, that would be our our plus on the on the Santa Barbara side. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'd say that this, this area allows our employees to live their values with the, with the beach and with the trails that are, that are afforded to us. Like, we can do that every day. Um, the one negative I'll say is sometimes we're preaching to the, the choir a little bit. So I used to, before I went back to school, worked in the oil and gas industry. My boss did it as well, or worked with companies in that space. So every time we're kind of gut checking ourselves, saying, how would we pitch this to one of the people we used to work with? Would they buy this? Um, are they interested in this without the whole you know, California twist on it? And so that's kind that's of a, a an exercise we do a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're a very small team, um, but we both really enjoy living here, don't we, Jackson? <laughs> um, and uh, it's nice having Patagonia nearby. We look at a lot of the same companies, so we um, attract entrepreneurs to come through town, and they get to speak to both of us, and there's a growing little ecosystem here of entrepreneurship, innovation, and apparel, which is nice. Looking at the clock, it's 8 o'clock, and uh, Matthew is stalking with a microphone in his hand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say um, thank you uh, very much to the audience for coming, and, but thank you guys very much. Thank you, yes. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you.